Our gospel today and the subject of my reflections come to us from Matthew 25. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one, the foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in and with him, with him in the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> Let me open us with a prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I'd like to spend some time um, looking through this most hard parable. It is a parable that, in the church's wisdom, is one of the gospel readings uh, throughout this pre-Advent season. This is the gospel reading of the 22nd Sunday after Pentecost, which was just a few days ago. It is, in the church's wisdom, scriptures, Old and New Testament, begin to focus upon God's coming. But it raises a question for us. Is it a good thing for God to come? Is it a good thing for God to be with us? Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5 that the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And the writer of the book of Hebrews says it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So this parable is one of those stories that make us wonder about how anxious we are for God to come. For when God shows up in the Bible, people die or they wish they were dead. I'm an art historian, and I have been very much interested in this parable uh, because many artists in the Western tradition have represented it. And I have for you two examples that we will look at that will help us clarify and dig deeper into this most enigmatic and mysterious story. One of the earliest depictions of this, of this parable were in the 6th century in the so-called Rossano Gospels. The first one I would like you to look at is William Blake's The Wise and Foolish Virgins. It is one of the most visually arresting and beautiful interpretations of the story. Blake chooses the moment in which the wise virgins condemn the foolish ones for not having their oil and not being prepared. Like so many of Jesus' other parables, this story is easily read as a morality tale, as Blake does. That is a story that is intended to communicate a particular moral or axiom, and oh, how we love such stories. We're like the Duchess in Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, who declares to Alice, everything's got a moral, if only you can find it. We try to squeeze every last drop of moral lessons from every story, painting, film, or other cultural artifact. The moral, of course, in this story is get ready. Make sure you have your oil to light your lamps. Be prepared. Do the diligent work. Be industrious. Don't be lazy. And as I was looking through the, um, the images of artists over the past several hundred years who have, who have depicted this picture, that is how the artists, the painters, have depicted it. Bright-eyed, wise virgins, untainted by rich food, drink, cards, and other forms of dissipation, and armed with sanctimonious and dour looks on their faces, peer down on the unfortunate virgins who have wasted their time by partying and sleeping in. The parable of the wise and foolish virgins 
virgins has become a story with a moral. It is a celebration of the virtuous, wise virgins who must have done something right. And certainly Jesus does tell us to be alert, to be watchful because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus asks his disciples to pray with him, but he has to wake them up not once, but twice. If we're honest with ourselves, however, these depictions in the Gospel do not feel like grace to us. They feel like law. You better be prepared. Do not be lazy. Don't waste your time. As we picture Jesus saying this like a parent wagging his finger at us. And so the question that must come to you and to me when we hear this and other parables like it is which are we, the wise or the foolish ones? In order to answer this question and deal with the nagging feeling that Jesus is doing the exact opposite of making our burdens light and our loads easy, I want to spend some time with some of the elements of the parable itself. And I want to follow some of Martin Luther's reflections. First of all, Luther reminds us that these virgins, all ten are God's beloved. The, bride's, the bridegroom is courting all ten of them. They all go out together. Luther reminds us that these are not, the foolish virgins are, virgins are not the Gentiles who rage against God, the heathen. They are God's beloved. And the bridegroom bids all to wait for him. All ten of the young ladies have lamps. And they're going out to wait. Luther says the lamp is the outward appearance of preparedness. They all look prepared. They are all ready. But it is what is inside the lamp that matters. What is inside the lamp, this oil that cannot be seen from the outside, generates the flame. And so the lamp, the lamp isn't just a token, something to carry with these young ladies. It's actually the expression of what's inside. And we see oil in the scriptures. We read it in Psalm 23. You anoint my head with oil. Or we read about it in a remarkable story in 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7, in which Elisha saves the life of a widow and her young child by miraculously producing oil. As long as she can find the jars, the containers, oil miraculously is filled, or fills those containers. And the implication is, if she could find, continue to find more containers, there will be more oil. The oil comes to us. We receive the oil. We are anointed with it. It comes to us as a gift from God. And so we have to admit and recognize that these wise virgins receive the oil from God. The story doesn't tell us how they got it. We assume that they were industrious and got it themselves. But that is only an extrapolation based on what the foolish virgins do in response to not having it. These wise young ladies have been given the oil. And that should remind us of what Paul asks in one of his letters to the Corinthian church. What do you have that you have not received? Oil is only received. And who is the giver of the oil? It is God. And that oil is faith. Luther sees the flame as the Holy Spirit, the light of faith, the shining glory of God. And we recall that Israel is the light unto the nations. It is the light of God's love for the world, and faith is that oil that allows the flame to burn. But our intuitive reading of this parable, reading I would suggest honors the old Adam, is that the foolish ones are the 90 percenters. They go most of the way, but they can't close it out. They've got some character defect, an addiction, or something that keeps them from being completely prepared of getting to the market and getting the oil in time. So again, we read the story as God saying to us, buckle down, do more, do it earlier. Try harder, be more prepared. 
And that is what our culture and many of our churches tell us in a hundred different ways. Be ready because God chooses the wise among us. But the problem is, as it relates to the God whom we stand before, we are never ready. I recall um, a number of years ago when my grandfather died. He had died in his mid-80s. My grandmother, my grandparents had been married for well over 60 years. And on the day of his funeral, my grandmother confessed to us, I thought we were going to have a long life together. <laughs> we are never ready. I have a good friend who shaped his entire professional career and family life around living close to his mother so that he could be there at the time of her death, that he could say goodbye to her, that he could not be across the country and hear of her death. And one day, she died of a heart attack when he was at work. He missed it. Could not tell her goodbye. We are never ready. So let's return to the parable. The bridegroom tarries. He waits. He doesn't come immediately. And perhaps we think he's forgotten us. God and Moses spend some extra time together, and the Israelites make a golden calf. Jesus takes a while in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the disciples doze off. It is not God, however, it is God, not the virgins, however, that is the subject of this parable. And although God may be absent, he is working and working on our behalf. His absence is divine grace and mercy and patience. And we wait. And we sleep. Sleep gets a bad rap in our culture. It's very unproductive. It's a badge of honor to say you are sleep deprived because you're working so hard, burning the candle at both ends. Sleep has also become symbolic of our irrationality and vice because we lose intellectual control. Goya's famous etching of the sleep of reason is something that shapes how we think of sleep. Morality and virtue is a matter of being awake, alert, always mentally, cognitively, intellectually awake so we can do, be active. And we tend to impose this view of sleep onto the scriptures. But sleep is also something much more positive in the scriptures. Because when we sleep, God can actually do something with us. He can actually get some work done. It reveals our weakness, our creaturehood. It's a little death, and God kills in order to make alive. God grows the crops when we sleep. When we sleep, we stop trying to control the world. We stop being grumpy gods, as Luther says, and become once again happy humans. And in 1 Corinthians 3, 7, Paul writes, So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God. Only God who makes things grow. And in the parable of the growing seed in Mark 4, the sower does nothing but reap. He doesn't even know how the plants grow. He doesn't even know how the crop got there. Jesus says, stay alert, but we can't. The rich young ruler tells Jesus, yeah, I've kept all the commandments. And then he goes away disappointed. Peter says to Jesus, I'm ready and prepared to defend you to the death. And Jesus says, oh, you won't. The tribes of Israel tell Joshua that they'll obey all God's commandments. And Joshua says, no, you won't. I came across a wonderful and I think very insightful and helpful picture by James Tiso of this theme, and it reminds us of something very important. A visual reminder that both the wise and foolish virgins are sleeping. No one stays awake. That is, no one is busy doing stuff for the bridegroom. Both the wise and the foolish drop off. And this picture gives us a wonderful depiction of these slumbering, sleeping maidens and what is doing the work is the flame from the oil. 
I'd like to conclude our reflection on the details of this parable with some thoughts on what happens when the bridegroom comes. We might find the wise virgins to be a bit haughty and arrogant and selfish for denying them help. But Luther reminds us that faith is not something that is shared. The Enlightenment era writer J.G. Hamann observed that faith is not bought and sold like merchandise. These foolish virgins cry out, like the parable of the sheep and the goats, Lord, Lord, but they do not say, have mercy on me. They point to what they've done in the parable of the sheep and goats or tried to do. We didn't get to the store on time. Instead of begging for mercy, they run out to buy the oil, treating it merely as merchandise, something to be bought, borrowed, and sold. Not unlike the magician in the book of Acts who happens upon the disciples' miracles and his response is not praise God, but I want to buy that trick. What does God demand and what pleases God? Psalm 51 says a broken and contrite heart, a heart that casts all on the mercy of the Lord. Not a heart that rests in what is done or left undone. So let's return to our question in conclusion. Which are you? Are you wise or foolish? Of course, I hope by now you know that this is the wrong question. This is the question that the old Adam asks, the old Adam that needs a to-do list, needs resolutions, get up earlier for devotions, stay up later for evening prayers, that runs out to buy oil or curses themselves for not being industrious enough. I'll go to the store earlier next time as if the bridegroom simply wants us to be more productive and efficient, and the foolishness of the virgins is due to the fact they didn't buy the oil earlier in the week. So if we're never really ready, what does being ready look like for the new Adam? It looks like not working, but waiting, not preparing, but being still. In the Gospel of John, Jesus' disciples ask him, what must we be doing to be doing the will of God? And Jesus' response is, believe in the one he has sent. Believe. Believe the promises of God. Have faith that God will indeed have mercy on you, that he has not forgotten you, that he is coming no matter the time, no matter the circumstances. That is your oil, and it cannot be purchased can only be given by the one whose words create faith and the one by whose words we live and breathe. In the Bible, God comes to men and women and they despair. But God says, do not be afraid. He says to the drowsy disciples at Gethsemane, let's go. He tells Peter, you will feed my sheep. And he tells us, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age and I will never leave you nor forsake you. And God can say this because Jesus comes to die for us, not to shut the door on your face. The bridegroom comes to save, not to judge. And so what else does waiting look like? Sometimes it may even look like sleeping. Praise God. <laughs>